The next case, American Standard versus Scheckman, again deals with a case of incomplete performance, but it comes to exactly the opposite conclusion from Peavy House, which we saw in the last lecture, and Jacob and Young's versus Kent, which we saw in the beginning of the course. The plaintiff in this case is American Standard, which ran a pig iron manufacturing plant on the Niagara River at the western end of New York State. When they decided to close the plant, they contracted with Harold Scheckman, a demolition and excavating contractor who paid $275,000 to buy the buildings and other structures and most of the equipment. In exchange for these, Scheckman also promised quote, to remove the equipment, demolish the structures, and grade the property as specified in preparation for American Standard sale of the property. As it turns out, Scheckman did not comply with these contractual requirements. There was, quote, a substantial deviation from the required grade lines, unquote, and there were still walls, foundations, and other structures jutting out from the ground. But the time, by the time of trial, American Standard had nevertheless succeeded in selling the property for $183,000, which Scheckman contended was only $3,000 less than its fair market value. At trial, the judge instructed the jury that the proper measure of damages was the cost of completion, not the diminution in the property's value. The jury went on to award American Standard $90,000 in damages, rather than the $3,000 that Scheckman argued for. We are reading the decision from the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court of New York. Recall that New York confusingly uses the term Supreme Court for its lowest level of courts. The, the question on appeal was whether the plaintiff was entitled only to difference in value damages rather than cost of completion. Justice Hancock ruled for the plaintiffs, but his opinion is not entirely satisfying. Justice Hancock's reasoning takes cost of completion as the default rule. In the usual case, quote, where the contractor's performance has been defective or incomplete, the reasonable cost of replacement or completion is the measure, unquote. His task is to figure out whether precedents like Jacob and Young versus Kent require him to deviate from this general rule. Jacob and Young's, as a decision of the Court of Appeals of New York, was binding precedent for this case. As you'll recall, the rule there was that when the cost of completion was grossly and unfairly out of proportion to the good to be attained, the court would calculate damages based on diminution in value rather than cost of completion. In that case, Judge Cardoza found that requiring a contractor to replace an inadvertent substitution of an equally good pipe with the contracted brand would be grossly disproportionate, and so Cardoza awarded only the minimal diminution in value. Justice Hancock makes three arguments for distinguishing American Standard and Scheckman versus Scheckman from Jacob and Young's. The first argument rests on the distinction between unintentional good faith omissions and intentional ones. He relies on Judge Cardozo's statement in Jacob and Young's that, quote, a contractor who would ask the court to apply the diminution in value measure as an instrument of justice must not have breached the contract intentionally and must show substantial performance made in good faith. In this case, the contractor denied that the contract even required him to do the grading he was now being sued for failing to do. It clearly wasn't an oversight. He intended not to grade uh, the property as the court found the contract required. Academics have supported this distinction as a test for what type of damages to award. In a 1982 article, Patricia Marshall argued that the key factor is whether the breach was willful or non-willful. The highest possible damages, usually cost of completion, should be awarded where the breaching party is willful in order to deter such willful breaches. One thing that may puzzle you about this argument, though, is that 
the mining company in Peavy House seems to have behaved even more egregiously, more willfully, and yet the PV House has received only damages equal to the diminution in value of their property. We will see that the court's other arguments are similarly out of alignment with PV House. The court's second main argument is about what counts as economic waste for purposes of Jacob and Young's. In this case, the court tells us that disparity in relative economic benefits is not the equivalent of economic waste, which was uh, invoked in Jacob and Young versus Kent. But it doesn't really give us a satisfying substitute rule. Instead, it, it counters with the principle from Chamberlain versus Parker that a landowner is allowed to build a, quote, monument to his caprice or folly, and that the court will still enforce a contract even where performance of the contract would diminish the value of, of the owner's land, at least the market value of the owner's land, it cites a line of cases where, like here, plaintiffs sought and received cost of completion damages far exceeding any increase in the land's market value. The problem with this line of argument is that it proves too much. Why wasn't Kent's desire for Reading Pipe a monument to his caprice or folly, and therefore deserving of cost of completion damages? The court attempts to argue that the key distinction of economic waste is defects in construction which are irremediable, irremediable or which may not be repaired without a substantial tearing down of the structure as in Jacob and Young's. But PV House did not involve any tearing down of structures or irremediable defects. There the mining company simply failed to fulfill its obligation to remediate and yet it only had to pay for diminution of value. Timothy Muris has argued that the way to distinguish monuments to one's own folly from cases like this one is to look at subjective versus objective value. In PV House, the owners intended to keep the property and the main purpose of the restoration was to improve their subjective enjoyment of the property. The same goes for monument to folly cases. Muris suggests that in these cases, the correct measure is cost of per completion, since the plaintiffs truly want the end result of completion. On the other hand, in this case, American Standard, uh, in this case, American Standard sold the property immediately, and so we can conclude that its only real interest in the land was its market value. In cases such as this one, Muris argues, the diminution in value of the property is the proper measure of damages. The third distinction the court attempts to draw is between the main purpose of the contract and incidental purposes. Justice Hancock argues that the PV House Court gave only diminution of value damages because the failure to restore the land was only incidental to the contract, whose main purpose was to extract coal. On the other hand, he views the grading work as central to the purpose of the contract between American Standard versus Sheckman. Rather than provide arguments for these positions, Justice Hancock merely says that the grading, quote, cannot be said to be incidental. He claims without justification that Sheckman, quote, can hardly assert that what he left unfinished was of trivial or inappreciable importance. But we very much could dispute that, the court's assertion. Remember who was paying whom here? Sheckman paid American Standard more than a quarter of a million dollars to purchase its old equipment. From that perspective, the agreement to grade the property seems incidental, or no less incidental than the bargain for contract provisions the PV houses had with the Garland Coal Company. Both the cost of performance and diminution in value damage measures can be see, they can be seen as ways of implementing expectation damages but they do so under different assumptions about what the plaintiff will do with the damage money. Cost of performance implicitly assumes that the plaintiff will take the damages and use it to actually purchase performance. Cost of performance accordingly puts the plaintiff in the position she would have been in if the defendant had performed by giving the plaintiff sufficient funds to buy substitute performance. Diminution in value damages, on the other hand, implicitly assume that plaintiff is not 
interested in using the money to buy substitute performance and instead tries to put the plaintiff in the same economic position as if performance had occurred by giving her sufficient funds to compensate for any diminution in, in value caused by the plaintiff's breach. What's particularly perverse about the Sheckman decision is that the plaintiff has no opportunity to use the money to purchase substitute performance because American Standard has already sold the property. Giving cost of performance in such a situation can overcompensate, providing a, uh, the plaintiff with a kind of windfall. One idea for how to improve this legal mess is to allow plaintiffs to choose between damages for diminution in value or specific performance, but not damages for cost of completion. Where plaintiffs really do want to erect monuments to their own folly, they can insist on specific performance by the defendant. But American Standard wouldn't really have wanted specific performance since it didn't have any remaining interest in having the property graded proper properly now that the property had been sold. All it lost was the value uh, of the property. And so it would settle with Sheckman for anything over $3,000. Of course, plaintiffs like American Standard could still sue for specific performance and then use that or court order uh, in order to bargain for significant side payments from the defendants who otherwise would have to pay the entire cost of uh, completing the contract themselves. And now, let's look at this quiz. Imagine that Mark hires a contractor to build an incredibly ugly building on his property. If built, the building will actually blight the view and reduce the value of Mark's property. The contractor pours a foundation, but then fails to complete the project. In which of the following situations is it more appropriate to calculate damages based on cost of completion? A, Mark is planning to live on the property for the rest of his life. The building has been designed by his favorite modernist architect. Or B, Mark is, misguided, is a misguided real estate developer hoping to flip the property. He thinks the building will get him a better price for it. Well, you should see that cost of completion damages are more appropriate in situation A. Here, Mark seeks to get the subjective value of the building, which he appreciates even if no one else does. In Professor Muris's view, cases involving subjective value just, justify damages based on cost of completion. In situation B, the only value of the building to Mark is in its ability to make the property more valuable when sold. This is a matter of objective value, and so courts should award damages based on the diminution in market value, which in this case is likely to be very small or even zero. We have seen great inconsistency in the cases about when the proper measure of damages is diminution of value as opposed to cost of completion. You should be aware that some considerations that courts take into account when deciding which type of damages to allow are whether the nonconformity was willful or accidental, whether the case involves subjective or objective value, and the centrality of the omission to the original agreement. But keep in mind that the default rule remains cost of completion. On the Niagara River at the western end of New York State, when they decided to close the plant, they contracted with Harold Sheckman, a demolition and excavating contractor who paid $275,000 to buy the buildings and other structures and most of the equipment. In exchange for these, Sheckman also promised, quote, to remove the equipment, demolish the structures, and grade the property as specified in preparation for American Standard sale of the property. As it turns out, Sheckman did not comply with these contractual requirements. There was, quote, a substantial deviation from the required grade lines, unquote. And there were still walls, foundations, and other structures jutting out from the ground. Toward American Standard $90,000 in damages, rather than the $3,000 that Sheckman argued for. We are reading the decision from the appellate division of the Supreme Court of New York. Recall that New York confusingly uses the term Supreme Court 
for its lowest level of courts. The, the question on appeal was whether the plaintiff was entitled only to difference in value damage, but the time, by the time of trial, American Standard had nevertheless succeeded in selling the property for $183,000, which Sheckman contended was only $3,000 less than its fair market value. At trial, the judge instructed the jury that the proper measure of damages was the cost of completion, not the diminution in the property's value. The jury went on to award. The next case, American Standard versus Sheckman, again deals with a case of incomplete performance, but it comes to exactly the opposite conclusion from PV House, which we saw in the last lecture, and Jacob and Young's versus Kent, which we saw in the beginning of the course. The plaintiff in this case is American Standard, which ran a pig iron manufacturing plant 